if I get anything wrong, I'm used to editing it. So there'll be some jump cuts in this presentation. So have you ever heard the expression, a picture tells a thousand words? This picture, for example, Nighthawks by Edward Hopper, says America, says longing, says loneliness, says a whole bunch about a specific time in American culture. Then there's this picture, which is a more recent example. It says basic division. It says Marvel. It says a whole bunch about the meme template, about the Drake music video that it's based on. The phrase communicates the idea that pictures are an incredibly efficient way of communicating information without actually saying any words. And to follow that through, cinema and video more broadly is the most information dense of all current art media, although I use cinema broadly when it comes to Michael Bay. 24,000 words a second. If a picture is worth 1,000, cinema is 24,000 words a second, plus the information that's encoded in the dialogue, in the music, in the audio. But for the longest time, the technology required to make a moving picture was limited. It was incredibly expensive and bulky. Only movie studios could afford it, or insanely rich individuals. So when audiences saw a moving picture, they knew that it was a curated image, that it was something put on for the cameras. But at the start of the 21st century, miniaturization, technological advance, has led us to the point where we all have a cinema camera in our pocket. Every one of you who has a smartphone could make a movie. In 2015, the movie Tangerine premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, and it was shot entirely on the iPhone 5S. The peak of information transfer, 24,000 words a second in the palm of your hand. And as soon as this technology became available, immediately everybody wanted to use it. Why wouldn't you? And in 2005, YouTube was founded, back in the prehistory of the internet. And Today, it's the second most popular website in the world, behind Google, who owns YouTube. And <laughs> Monopoly? No, nothing. <laughs> and approximately a billion hours of videos are watched every day on YouTube. And it's difficult to assess, but for young people, YouTube and online video has become the primary medium that young people consume. But what I find interesting, combined with this, is the fact that every day on YouTube, approximately half a million hours are uploaded. As soon as video production via cameras and distribution became democratized and anybody can do this, a level playing field emerged. Suddenly, it wasn't just the movie studios that could do it. And individuals posting as themselves, like Philip DeFranco and Charlie McDonald and Jenna Morey, they grew organically audiences that were huge, just being themselves, just being an honest depiction of who they were on the internet. Now, I know there are other genres on YouTube. There's gaming, there's comedy, there's beauty, but I'm going to focus on video blogging in this talk because it's the genre that I have familiarity with. As you've already heard, I have my own YouTube channel. I uh, have been making video blogs since 2010, and I've recently just passed the 10 million total views milestone. So apparently, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and for the past couple of years, I've been living two lives then because, as you've heard, I've been an academic. I just finished my PhD in atmospheric physics. And I've also been making videos almost full time in the evenings as a video producer. So today, what I want to do is combine those two ways of thinking and talk a little bit about the theory behind online video and video blogging specifically. Because it's not just people like me that are vlogging. Take WhatsApp, for example. The company estimated last year that a billion videos are shared on its service every day. And those are videos that are shot by everyday users. They're shot on phones. They're mostly short. And actually, I can't really see you, but let's do a show of hands. Put your hand up here if over the past, say, two weeks, you've taken video on your phone and uploaded it to Instagram or WhatsApp or Messenger or anything like that, anything online. And why wouldn't you, right? It's 24,000 words a second. Why would you bother typing that when you can just record it? So, OK, it's caught up. <laughs> Um, young people now are in the unique position in history where for the first time the primary medium that they're consuming is also a medium that they are creating in. And they're consuming media that their peers are creating and also that their idols are creating in the same format on the same websites. And that has a couple of profound implications. I'm going to talk about one of them today and something on the horizon that has me immensely concerned as well as an opportunity. And this is what I call the Blair Witch Effect. Ooh. Now, 
For those of you that don't know, The Blair Witch Project was a 1999 horror movie. It was uh, portrayed as found footage. These three students went off into the woods filming a spooky local legend, and they disappeared. And then a year later, somebody found the tape that they'd been filming. And of course, it wasn't. It was fiction. But everything about the movie corroborated that idea from the aspect ratio of the, the camera that they used, from the quality of the audio, from the marketing. It made it so much scarier to either consciously or subconsciously believe that what you were watching was real. So you could argue that the Blair Witch Project possessed a quality known as verisimilitude. Great word for Scrabble. <laughs> which is to say the appearance of being true or real. Now let's contrast that with media shot by young people on phones. It's characterized by its actual truthfulness, by the fact that it is real. If your friend uploads something into your WhatsApp group, you have no reason to doubt that it's what they saw, right? It was an honest depiction of reality. Everything about it that you've consumed over the years, from the number of pixels to the aspect ratio to the physical device that you watch it on, everything points to media consumed in this way being true. And that means there's a tremendous potential for deception. And it was this technique which I used to psychologically manipulate impressionable young people a few years ago, for good. <laughs> I was using it to try and educate people about the University of Oxford. This is my, uh, uh, the front quad of my college, St. Peter's, the best college in Oxford. And um, I'm, not, I'm not biased. And you've already heard that I came from an unusual background in going to Oxford. I went to a state school. No one in my family had been to university before. So I believed an awful lot of the myths that still abound about Oxbridge. I thought that maybe you had to speak Latin to get in, that you had to know somebody who went to the university to get in, or you know, they might check the records stretching back a 1,000 years and say if any of your relatives had been. Of course, all of that's nonsense. It doesn't actually happen. But these beliefs persisted, and I had no one to tell me otherwise. So when I got there and realized that these myths were exactly that, I decided to make some video blogs about this topic, Oxvlogs. And I chose video blogs very specifically because the information is out there. The university is constantly trying to convince people that these things aren't true. But the information is put across in a glossy prospectus, a glossy university website with soft focus libraries and suspiciously ethnically diverse candid group photos. <laughs> The university is clearly trying to peddle a product. It's trying to peddle itself. It wants people to come there. By contrast, a single man on the internet with a Movember moustache, that wasn't of my own volition, <laughs> out of focus, terrible lighting, terrible audio, this was in a format that was accessible to young people by their peers. It was exactly the same kind of thing they're used to consuming, and so they associated it with truthfulness. And people believed what I was putting out there, even though it was the same information, much more than official university sources. But while my video blogs did contain the truth, it was a personalized account of the truth, not all social media personalities, if you like, not all creators are the same. Because whilst they may have risen to prominence, like Charlie McDonnell, like Philip DeFranco, on being themselves online, at the start, this was an expression of creativity. It was just them being them. It wasn't any kind of monetization. But as soon as something becomes monetized, there are inevitably biases, half-truths, exaggerations. I'm not accusing the broad YouTube community of lying, but there are certain aspects which aren't quite true. And the discrepancy between the verisimilitude of video content and the truth can be quite striking when it's revealed, because we are willing to tolerate lies. In fact, we lie to ourselves. Think about shows like Geordie Shaw, or The Only Way is Essex, or Made in Chelsea. Anybody who's made any media, it's painfully obvious that these shows are scripted. It's not real. But people tell themselves, either consciously or subconsciously, that it's, it is. It's a documentary. Because it's more entertaining to believe so. In the same way that it was scarier to believe that the Blair Witch Project was found footage, it's more entertaining to believe that these things are reality documentaries. And I believe that this is what YouTube audiences are starting to do to themselves. In the face of half-truths, let's say, they're willing to suspend their disbelief and believe that it's what they're seeing is still honest because of the format that they're seeing it in, because of the format that they're used to from their peers. And a really interesting example happened earlier this year. This is a YouTube channel called Hat Films. 
which is one of my favorite channels. And they did a video about something called the Azana Band, what a uh, guy in the middle is wearing around his neck. This is a VR accessory that allows gamers to experience whatever their character is feeling in a game. That could be pleasure, fear, or pain. And this is a, a kind of video that they do all the time. It's actually the most common way that YouTubers support themselves. In exchange for payment, you do a video on a particular topic, uh, a service, or a product. And you put your personal spin on it, but it's funded by the company. They'd done lots of videos like this before. The difference was, the Azana Band isn't real. It's not a real product. It was invented as part of a viral marketing campaign. But as part of their contract, they presented it as being a real product, and they reacted to it accordingly. And when the discrepancy was revealed, it came out on Reddit that it wasn't a real product, the reaction was emotive. Creators have an unparalleled level of trust with their audience. They have a personalized verisimilitude that people are willing to sustain and almost lie to themselves to get more entertainment out. And this has me immensely worried. Not that I think Hat Films did anything wrong. I actually would have taken the same deal, I think, in the same situation. What worries me is that they were offered this deal in the first place. Because currently, media executives are of an age and I buy media executives, I mean the people who are commissioning shows, who are commissioning advertising campaigns, who are changing the course of mainstream media. They are of an age where they haven't grown up with YouTube. They haven't grown up with Twitch or watching people on Instagram. But in the next five to ten years, the feedback loop between the audience and the people who control the media is going to close. And the potential for deception is going to be realised, I think. Now, more than ever, we need to be conscious critics of all these words per second that are flying at us. And we are perfectly poised to do so, because we create ourselves. We need to use the knowledge that we have in creating our own media to affect how we critique what we consume. Will that happen? I'm a bit of a pessimist, and I don't think it will. But I want to leave on a positive note, and I want to tie this back to education, where I started with the Blair Witch Effect, where I first noticed this. I want to present to you a vision of the future. What if, in the future, that personal relationship between the creator and the audience is embraced and not shunned? And what if, in the future, academics are given time and funding and encouraged by institutions to use the format, to contextualize their research, to do outreach, but showing it in the context of a personal video blog that's entertaining and educational and relatable because they are humans in it, and not a glossy, highly produced documentary that you might see on the BBC, but a honest, depiction of what this person's life is like, showing how the science and their research and whatever it is they're doing fits into them as a human. Because I don't think that we've seen the ultimate form of the educational vlog. It seems that when any media arrive, arises, the effective use of it for education is one of the last things to arrive, and I don't think we've seen that yet. The day of the educational vlogger is still ahead of us. This format isn't going away. It's the most effective way to transfer information in a personable way, in a trusting way. Its words are powerful. So let's use them for good. Thank you.